to New American Youth Ballet Presents. We are so honored to have the great Skylar Brandt here with us and joining us as a special guest. So thank you so much for taking some time. I know you just mentioned you're, you're waiting for rehearsal to start. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about yes. what you're working yes. on? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, we're actually, ABT is um, hosting a five-week residency in upstate New York. We're about to work on a brand new piece of choreography with our um, choreographer in residence, uh, Lexi Rotmanski. So we are, currently, yeah, we are about to start that creation process and that rep will then live on in the rest of our um, repertoire in the future and also be filmed at the end of this uh five week period and presented at some point virtually as things have moved to be yeah. in a virtual space. So yes, yeah. and I should say um, it's a little belated, but congratulations. You were not long ago promoted to principal dancer. Thank you so American much. Ballet Theater. So that <laughs> is amazing news. What was that day like? Like, how did you find out? Oh my gosh, it was dancer's dream. It was, uh, it was definitely my childhood dream realized. And it was just so surprising because I just felt that in this current political and financial, um, you know, state that promotions were not really on the table. So when I logged on to our all company staff meeting, um, on Zoom and they announced these promotions, I was just so taken aback because again, I just didn't think that, you know, this was a climate in which we'd be able to um, make those make those promotions happen. So I was so, you know, beside myself and so happy um, with that news, but also immediately felt the new pressures of, and responsibilities of now holding such a prestigious title with my absolute dream company. So <laughs> I'm working extra hard now too. Oh, it's so well-deserved. I can't, <laughs> I can't believe some of the things you do. The, the full promenade, oh, <laughs> it's sometimes a real challenge to find a good male partner. Well, not, not in your league, but, you know, Gros Adagio, sometimes you have to depend on, but you just went and did it by yourself. So. <laughs> that, was really, that was really something. Thank um, you so much. <laughs> and I see that you, you are no stranger to working by yourself, right? Do you feel that that's important for dancers to, to keep in mind? Pandemic, or no pandemic. Why is that so important? Definitely. You know, I think that um, each dancer has their own process to grow and to learn and continue to build, build on themselves. But um, for me, I've always found that using my off time to continue to grow and learn has just been so incredibly beneficial. And I just think that, you know, getting in the studio, having a whole chunk of time with my coaches to just be able to take things really slowly, work on every minute detail. And I think that that's kind of where I feel like I flourish the most is when I have that time to just completely break everything down and examine every step in its greatest detail. What, what's your favorite role or like role that you would like to play in a ballet? I think, you know, for me, one of my favorite um, roles that I ever danced was Giselle. I um, you would say that. I don't yeah. know why. I knew you would say that. <laughs> well, you know, it's so interesting because it, it actually wasn't ever a dream role for me. Um, I've always loved the ballet, but I didn't actually envision myself in that role. Um, I didn't think that I would necessarily be suitable for it. But when I was cast to do it, you know, it was all of a sudden this huge challenge to just kind of um, figure out how to make the role my own and to tap into what I felt were maybe more my weaknesses than my strengths um, to be able to, again, portray the role of Giselle in the best way that I could. And then after doing all of that work and realizing that actually I was capable of, of doing such a role, um, it kind of became one of my favorite uh, ballets. It just felt like a triumph for me to have been able to work through all of my insecurities in doing that ballet and, and feel better about it. So that's definitely a favorite of mine. And also Twyla Tharp's In the Upper Room is one of the most exhausting, most challenging, but most fun pieces that I've ever danced. Um, so really? that- The most yeah. interesting, even out of classical rep. 
Absolutely. It's one of these, you know, it's like a 45 minute marathon. It's, it's actually, it's a fantastic piece. Um, you dance, or at least the part that I dance is in sneakers and pajamas. So I'm basically in my happiest <laughs> form when I, ha- when I have that. Um, so that's, yeah, I would say those are the top, top two. And I would say, well, among many other technical uh, abilities, turning seems to be one of your, your most amazing fortes. Do you have advice for young dancers, especially during this time that people are turning? We are lucky to have a home studio, but that's not always the case. Sometimes you have carpets, men, all kinds of surfaces. What, what's the most important thing for dancers to do to keep their placement, to keep their, their turning on hold? I think do? that honestly, obviously safety is, is number one. You know, as you said, everybody's in a different situation with a different setup, um, different floors, you know, maybe not the safest floors. So I think that, you know, being able to judge whether dancers are, would like to practice their pirouettes on flat or on point, um, you know, that's obviously going to make a big difference um, to the feeling of security in the pirouette. But I think that um, having strong, um, Legs and ankles are really, really uh, imperative for being able to execute clean pirouettes. So I like to put a lot of the combinations that I do at the bar on demi point just to continue to build that strength. Um, I think that my top tips for pirouettes are to incorporate a deep plie to feel like the body is spiraling on plie before going into the releve and to be able to take the arms and the back with the body ahead of time as opposed to trying to close the arms while we're already on point or demi point. The arms have a lot of weight to them. So by all of a sudden moving them while we're already up in the turn, it can have a really big chance of throwing us off our balance. So I think that again, using that spiral momentum, taking a really deep plie and getting the arms to the position ahead of time before the actual pirouette happens um, are all just a recipe for hopefully a successful pirouette. (laughs) I think we had this conversation before where you said, you know, each dancer, because our proportions are all different, so you feel it's okay for each dancer, depending on their, their body type, to place their arms, make adjustments according to that, that dancer, because we're not all built like a top. We're not all the same. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that, you know, for me, I mean, even figuring out my pirouettes, I had to just do a lot of trial and error. And I think that, you know, not every correction works for every person as we're all individuals. So there's not one right way to go about doing a pirouette. It's just a matter of consistency and what works best for the dancer. Not everybody says that, which is refreshing advice. Because sometimes you could bang your head against the wall for five years trying to do something that's perfect on one type, but maybe not on another dancer. Very true. And I think that, you know, being being a current professional dancer and, and also now being somewhat of a teacher just more recently in this last year with the pandemic, I respect the fact that, you know, not everything works for everyone. And, you know, it's not about the teacher's ego as much as it is about trying to help the dancer find what works best for them. So I truly believe that, you know, it's a, it's a matter of just playing around with things and again, finding the right path for each person. Um, it's really really important. So as you say, everybody has different lengths of arms, different lengths of torsos and legs. Again, it's totally individual. And I think that a lot of it is just practice. All right. That brings me to another question. Why, why were you teach? Are you nice? <laughs> Pardon? What did you say? Why will you teach? Are you nice? Mm-hmm. Why I would know, I? It's a funny question, but people in the field know exactly what I mean. How many mean teachers are there out there? And why okay. are you nice? Oh, oh my God. <laughs> why is it important not to like scare a student? Why is that important in this field? Totally. I completely understand what you're saying. And you know, it's it's interesting, even as a young child at eight years old, I had you know, a very strict um, Russian teacher. And I actually really loved that. I love the fact that she didn't patronize me. I love the fact that she treated me as an adult. I felt like there was a greater level of respect there. And I felt like I was able to work more efficiently and get more done having more direct feedback. Um, But there's obviously a tone and a way to do that that is also nurturing, which I think is also so important Ballet is hard enough as it is as an art form. And I think that, you know, the more encouragement that you can feed to your students, the better. And I think, you know, as as dancers and as teachers, we've all been there. We all know what it's like to work with 
teachers that are intimidating, teachers that are super, super nice, teachers that, you know, demand a lot, teachers that don't really care. I mean, there's so many different personalities out there, but I think that, you know, keeping in mind um, just the end goal of, of improvement and reading the, the student's energy is also just so important um, to make for a successful um, partnership because that's really what it is between t- teacher and student, I think. And I agree with you. With There can be a strict teacher, but the honesty can also bring out the best because yeah. I've had teachers where you know they're not going to throw out a compliment. But when they do, it means all that much more. Because, oh, wow, I mm-hmm. finally got it. But then sometimes in everybody's journey, you might get somebody who is just cruel or bitter for the because of their own frustrations. And this pandemic, it's interesting, it's brought out all different sides to people. Yes. Right. It it brings out maybe the best and the worst. It depends. And some people are, you know, very frustrated. Everybody's frustrated for for various reasons. Yeah. But that's a good point that you say that. My mom always told me, because I've worked with some teachers who just completely, you know, took whatever they were going through out on me. Yes. And as a young kid, I remember my mom just teaching me such a valuable lesson, which is chances are it's probably not you. So just making that assumption that it's probably not you, it's probably something else that's going on at home, um, you know, I think is just a saving grace. And also being able to have a sense of humor. As a student, I always loved um, laughing at myself. I still in, enjoy that. I think well, that- you, you like laughing a lot, sometimes too Yeah, much. and I think it's totally the right approach to improvement. You know, it's like we can- do all of these really difficult things and work really, really hard, but we can also have fun in the process. So I think that having a good sense of humor is really, you know, is key as well. can really dance wow you can really dance he went he went they said we've both been dancing all this time what a coincidence the ballet world can be pretty tough can't it you make it look very easy but oh, thanks it's a pretty competitive, well, difficult world. <laughs> absolutely and obviously getting to this point is not without its its struggles and challenges but i think You know, I'm also, I try to adopt the mentality that it's not that nobody really cares, but it's like, it doesn't matter how you get to that point, as long as you are able to feel good about yourself, you know, sleep well at night, be proud of your own work, and again, continue to have fun in the process. So I think, you know, it's easy for, I think, this generation to feel like, this next generation coming up to feel like things should just be handed to them or they don't have to work super hard for the things that um, they receive. But at the end of the day, it really is about the hard work and it's it's about, um, you know, finding that motivation to continue to make yourself better and just not be complacent and wait for things to come to you. It's about going out and, and bettering yourself. It's interesting that you say that about like today, like, Kids here, I mean, we can say it because we're Americans, mm-hmm. but I think there is something to be said for training from, from teachers from all different places with a different cultural perspective. There's a lot more if you really embrace it, isn't there? Yes, yes. I mean, I think, you know, again, everybody has a different path, a different journey. And for those who just find it fun and don't want to make make it a professional career, I think that's also wonderful. And there's, you know, I think ballet is the type of thing that that everyone can enjoy at whatever age or whatever level. Um, but of course, for those who are pursuing it in a more serious way, I think it's it's extra important and crucial to remember that, you know, the art form is not what we see always on social media. Although social media is great, we get to we get a lot of information from that. You know, it's it's it's, it's overwhelming sometimes. Yeah, and I think it's it's easy enough to pose for a picture. But the real work happens in the studio and on stage and how much we, you know, we commit ourselves without those extra distractions of living in an in a social media um, age. 
Right. And so I think it's, you know, I think it's important for kids to not get wrapped up in what they see online only to learn from what they see, but to also take themselves and into the studio and, and work, work on themselves. Wait, do you have any pets? Oh no. Do I have any pets? Actually, yeah, we have um we have three dogs in our family. Um I used to, we used to have seven, but you know, some of them passed away. Um, but I'm a huge dog lover and I know that with corona there seems to be an adoption um boom. Obviously people find it to be like a good time to get to get a puppy. So I've also been thinking about it myself. What was I mean before the pandemic? At least what was like a typical day at ABT studio? Before the pandemic on a normal week um, at ABT, we would rehearse Tuesdays through Saturdays. Um, morning class would be at 10, 15 in the morning. And then we rehearse until seven o'clock at night, oftentimes even just without a break. So the schedules were pretty, pretty grueling, pretty intense. Um, that's usually in preparation for a tour or for our season at Lincoln Center. And then during our most, um, you know, grueling period, we have a two month season at the Metropolitan Opera House and we do uh, eight shows a week for two months. And usually um, when we're in performance, uh, we will rehearse. Um, we start with morning class at about 10 30 in the morning. We rehearse until about Five, and then we start our performances at 7.30 or 8 o'clock. And then we're dancing until 10.30, 11 o'clock at night, have to go home, you know, eat, shower, sleep, and then wake up to do it all again the next day. So, but those, I have to say, those times are definitely also the most rewarding um, as much as they're exhausting. <laughs> and what, what would a typical day be like now? I mean, I know you're in rehearsing in a studio now, but like at home, what do you do? Yeah. Sensible form. Yeah. So um, during the pandemic, obviously my schedule is a bit different, uh, but I will take class from my living room um, with my portable bar and my little piece of Marley. Uh, ABT offers classes via Zoom for the company members, so we're all able to tune in and take those. And then once gyms and studios reopened, I basically decided to book my own space and go to the studios and work with my coaches, Irina Dobrovenko and Max Bolotsarkovsky, who are both ex-ABT principal dancers, and we just work for a few hours on all different kinds of repertoire. And then usually I'll go home and either teach a few privates or... Um, um, do you know other work things but yes actually it's been great to be able to kind of maintain some sort of normalcy once the studios reopened in a safe fashion um, it's nice to be back in a larger space yeah and it looks like sometimes you work on a gamut of repertoire mm -hmm. And is that, do you, do you select that? Do your coaches select that? Yeah. So it's actually funny. Every time I walk into the studio, my coach looks at me and, and they either he or she, they say, um, what's on the menu today. And uh -huh. it's just because, you know, I will say, huh, I really have, have always wanted to learn Tchaikovsky Pa or yeah. hmm, can we start working on Swan Lake or, yeah. nice. you know, so I like to just it's kind of whatever mood I'm in. Um, I know I'm going to learn something from anything that I that I work on, even if I won't perform it for many years or I won't perform it ever. You know, I think again, there's always opportunity for growth and and knowledge and wisdom. So, um, yeah, I basically just you know think of my dream roles or the roles that are coming up the ballets that are coming up in our next season and I tried to start to work on that repertoire um, especially when you know before I was promoted when I was a core member um, and even as a soloist I would try to learn all of the repertoire for the following year so that um, if ever anyone exactly um, yeah. unfortunately got injured I would be ready to step in at the very last moment and to be honest that's how I've gotten almost all of my opportunities at ABT um, what was through again um, injury of other dancers and I was just ready to step in because I had worked on all of that um, all of that rep ahead of time you know just so that I could I could be the person to fill in. I think that's a really important lesson that I think sometimes dancers or athletes don't understand how important it is to take your 
like take the reins of your destiny yeah. and yes. put, in the, put in the extra work and the extra time like you do. I think it's very inspiring. And probably you were very prepared mentally also. When things shut down, you're used to working. Um, you're used to working a certain way. Yes. And yeah. Absolutely. And I think also when things shut down, you know, it was really devastating at first because I had just come off of the debut. I was about to can imagine Aurora and Sleeping Beauty and, you know, sort of feel like my momentum was just stopped, right? You yes. know, I stopped my tracks. It was really yeah. hard to contend with. So I think that, you know, by, again, trying to figure out what my routine would be in the middle of a quarantine or a pandemic, um, you know, it was it was challenging to figure that out. But again, I needed to be able to feel like I was making the best use of my time that I could. Yes. Well, I, I can't wait to see uh, you in these beautiful roles at the Met again. I know everything will reopen up. And, and just wh why, do you think, why do you think ballet and the arts are, are so important for people to fund and people to support ABT and keep, to keep this, this whole thing alive? Why, why is it? Why is it essential? Yeah, you know, I, I have to say, I, I mean, I've always, I've always enjoyed dancing and watching ballet because it's, it's made me, I don't know, it's like that whimsical period in time where you're just going, you're forgetting your surroundings, you're forgetting your, your problems, you're forgetting just the outside world and you're immersing yourself in something beautiful and, and, and storytelling. And that's, that's always what drew me in. And I think that you know, with the world, go, you know, kind of just like turned upside down and just everyone's going through so much. I think it's important to have those, um, yeah, to have those fleeting moments to watch dancers express themselves. Um, you know, I certainly, when I approach dance, I just, all I hope to do is to move people and make them feel something different and make them feel like they've escaped their normal lives and entered a whole new world when they're, when they're watching something. So I think that, you know, the arts is, it's the thing that saves humanity, saves, saves the world. And, um, and I think that especially given this difficult time, that's why it's just more important than ever.
like American Valley Theater is one of the few companies in the world because of, you know, it's it's not easy to have an orchestra. It's not easy. It's to, a luxury, a privilege. It, it really is. And yeah. why, I mean, we we went backstage with Maestro David LaMarche. He showed us the, oh, you know, the orchestra David. and everything, telling us his favorite ballets to conduct. Why, mm -hmm. why is the live music such an important part of a dancer's life? Oh, I think that, you know, live music, it just, it makes your perform your own performance um, more spontaneous. I think that also, That's you know- Exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you never know what tempo you're going to get. You never know how that wall of sound is just going to hit your body and hit your, your heart. I think that, yeah, just know feeling the energy from the orchestra pit, it just, it feeds, it feeds the movement and it indicates how, for, at least for me, how I want to dance, how I want to approach movement, how I want to express myself. I rely so heavily on music to indicate, um, my own movement quality. And I think that, you know, as you say, it's just, it's such a privilege to have live music. Um, yes. And it makes it, it makes it fresh and it makes it special and it makes it different every time. Yeah, for sure. Have a great rehearsal today and we can't wait to, to see the end result. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dreaming of becoming a ballerina and, and I was dreaming of becoming a ballerina and I was dreaming of becoming a ballerina dance at school, I dance around the house. Last, last song, I think it was Saturday or Sunday, I went to a ballet dance there when it wasn't my turn yet, but I go to sleep with music every night and I visualize, I just let it soak in so that I know the music more and like, I don't know how to explain my dreams. But it's like, it's not even too much telling a story either when you dance. You let it go and you tell the story.